first global health uh, ethics seminar. Um, I think this is a very timely moment to start this series of seminars. Uh, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, were adopted uh, on 25th of September, so uh, a good two, two weeks ago. And it presents a very broad agenda for the world, and health is central in there. It's one of 17 goals. Um, but the SDGs are pitched as integrated and indivisible, globally um, in nature and universal, universally applicable. That means applicable to all countries. So unlike the MDG agenda, which was really for the developing countries and what the developed countries could do about it, this is an agenda relevant to all, and it covers the economic, the social, and the environmental pillars of development. And that, I think, for global health presents a whole new context. Um, it's a context in which, of course, improved communication, technological advances, decreased trade barriers, uh, Many issues come into play and epidemics, demographic changes such as aging, antimicrobial resistance, the whole issues around NCD risk factors have a strong bearing on health, but they're cross-national global health issues that need to be addressed. So it cuts across borders. And I think within that context, there's also a need for a common understanding of justice, equity, and fairness, and there are very important lessons to be learned from national experiences. So the timing of this uh, Global Health Ethics uh, Seminar Series, I think, is very um, appropriate. And uh, we should thank the University of York Centers for Global Health, the Wellcome Trust, the work partnering with WHO to launch these series. So the idea is to have a, um, that the, the seminars will serve as a forum or leading ethicists, academics, healthcare workers, policymakers, and patients to examine key ethical issues in a global health uh, perspective and have a critical dis discussion uh, using a transparent and accessible platform. So today is, I'm, I'm welcoming you to the first in this series. Um, and we, we trust that this independent and innovative format including sort of the web broadcasting, uh, will contribute to both academic and practical landscape in global health ethics. So thank you very much for those in the room and those who are joining us uh, virtually. Uh, we have two uh, talks, but before I want to introduce those, uh, I would like to invite Dan O'Connell from the uh, Wellcome Trust to say a few words. Thank you, Keith, and thank you all of you for joining us here and online. My name is Dan O'Connor. I'm Head of Humanities and Social Science at the Wellcome Trust, uh, based in London. And we're absolutely delighted to be partnering with the World Health Organization and the University of York on the Global Health Ethics Seminar Series. Um, I want to add a note of personal thanks to Abba Saxena here at WHO, who has led on the development of this, and to Doc Professor Sanjoy Bhattacharya at York and Dr. Alexander Metzar at York who have been instrumental in helping us get this off the ground. Um, I won't speak for too long, but I just want to echo what Casey said. Um, Welcome Trust for those of you who I'm sure know what we do, but we are uh, an organization dedicated to improving human health across the globe. Um, and it's our firm belief that ethics are an essential part of improving health. You can spend as much money as you like getting the biomedical science right, but if you miss the ethical issues when doing it, um, you've missed it completely. So um, this form, uh, this forum, this format uh, for free and independent discussion of global health ethics issues uh, is a really important one and the Wellcome Trust is absolutely delighted to be partnering with WHO. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. And we're really grateful for the uh, support from the Wellcome Trust in this endeavor. So let's turn to the topic of today. Um, just last week, Alana, was it? The WHO published the uh, world, 1st of October. Oh, yeah, World, uh, yes, World Aging Day. Um, world Report on Aging and Health it has been published. And currently, WHO is in the process of developing a global strategy and action plan for healthy aging in consultation with member states. So in this first seminar, 
we will focus on the global context of increasing life expectancy and aging populations that many populations see at unprecedented speeds. So it's these changing demographics and also the clinical evolutions, the, the, the progress that result in important new responsibilities and opportunities for older people and raise important questions about how healthy aging can be promoted ethically. So this has obvious implications for, for health policy, including policies relevant to healthcare provision to older people. So this seminar will discuss the concepts that can underpin an ethical uh, approach for, the, uh, for care to care for the older person. So our first speaker is uh, Alana Officer, who is uh, a senior health advisor in the Department of Aging and Life Course. Um, Alana, uh, I, I see that you have a degree in podiatric medicine. All right, I thought it was a typo. Uh, and ap applied science and public health. And you started your career as a clinician in Australia and England. Um, and then have held a number of technical positions and managerial positions, particularly working on disability health and development in many parts of the world. And I think after uh, eight years on the working on disability in WHO, you have joined the Aging and Life Course Department and has been the central point, the coordinator for the for the global report on aging and health that uh, just uh, uh, hit uh, 12 days ago. And you're also working on age-friendly environments within that uh, department. So um, as first speaker, I would like to invite you to uh, update us on the highlights of the report and see what implications that has for policies. Yes. Yeah. So for those of you who haven't seen it, this is the World Report on Aging and Health, uh, which is the first ever World Report on Aging and Health. Um, and it summarizes the best available evidence that we have and outlines a framework for action around a new concept called functional ability. So I'm going to provide a very, very brief overview of the main findings of the report um, outline a couple of issues which then Chris is going to pick up in his discussion more focused on ethics. So as T said, we know that populations are ageing and that this is happening at a rate much faster than has been done in the past. The number of people aged 60 and over is currently around 900 million and will rise to 2 billion in 2050. And at that time, there will be more than one in five people uh, aged over 60, of which 80% will be living in low and middle income countries. But there is no typical older person, and evidence tells us that biological aging is in fact only very, very loosely associated with our age in years. So some 80 year olds have the physical and mental capacities of a 20 or a 30 year old. And yet others, 80-year-olds, require very significant care. And what we know as being absolutely crucial to the experience of health in older age is health. And the evidence suggests that contrary to popular belief, um, in fact, we're not actually healthier than previous generations. So the graph that I'm showing shows three high income country studies which are looking at people born from 1916 to 1956. And the data shows that there's actually over this time been very little change um, between generations in the level of instrumental activities of daily living. So these are the activities, you know, once you're up and dressed, cooking, getting out, uh, using a computer, shopping, um, etc. And really interestingly, we know that health in older age is in fact not random. So on the current slide, we can see that most of the interaction in terms of, or most of the ongoing interaction which happens between the individual and the environment is responsible for our health. So our environments include 
our housing, our community, our neighbourhoods, um, and factors that influence ageing, obviously, are how accessible our houses are, whether we get access to assistive technologies and other health care services, the level of accessible transport and social facilities, for example. And at the level of the individual, this includes uh, how healthy our behaviours are, whether we actually have any health conditions, age-related changes that we may be experiencing, and a very small amount of that is linked also to genetics. But the relationship between the individual and the environment is heavily mediated by personal characteristics, the family that we're born into, uh, our education, um, our sex, and our ethnicity. So, for example, the 80-year-old that I mentioned in the previous slide, who had very high levels of functioning, probably is much more likely to become from a socio-advantaged family, be well-educated, live in a safe environment, and have decent access to services. And the people with the poorest health are often those who have the least resources. And importantly, these sort of factors start interacting with each other and influence ageing, obviously, from childhood and the vast diversity that we see in the intrinsic capacity and the circumstances uh, in older age are likely to be underpinned by this cumulative impact of, of individual environment interaction over time. So an important point that the report makes is that for policy, it's really important that policy responds to these global trends in terms of population ageing, etc. But in doing that, it doesn't reinforce uh, the inequities that exist. So the report brings together the individual and uh, the environment aspects into what we are calling functional ability. So in the previous slide, all of the aspects on the left-hand side in terms of the individual comprise what we call intrinsic capacity, which is in this red box, um, which is obviously influenced by the environment in which we live. Um, and then uh, the environment, which is the, the larger blue box, which combined with uh, intrinsic capacity and the interaction between them is what we are calling functional ability. But really, if we're going to facilitate functional ability, we need to overcome a significant number of barriers to both individuals and populations. And even though I just said there was no typical older person, uh, society generally views older people um, in very stereotypical ways. Um, and this can lead to discrimination against individuals or groups simply on the basis of age. We call this ageism, when, as does most other people, and it's thought that that may even be more pervasive than sexism um, and racism as, forms, as a form of discrimination. The lack of accessibility that we have in transportation in terms of housing, social facilities, all tend to limit older people's participation. And inadequate or absent services is another very widespread barrier. For example, health systems are often designed to cure acute conditions and lack coordination across care providers and across settings. And the long-term care systems in most countries, uh, or in many countries, certainly low- and middle-income countries, and non-existent, placing uh, an unsustainable burden on families, predominantly women. Another really important barrier is the fact that older people are generally not consulted in uh, decisions that concern their lives. I just want to really look at some of these barriers in, in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to take the example of Japan and look at 1950, and I just want you to see how the population's changed. Um, since this time. So the line differentiates between, on the bottom, older populations and, and, and younger populations on the top. And you'll just see, as we go through time, that clearly the, sh the population is shifting up until 19 to 2050, where there are significantly more older people um, than younger people in the population. What we tend to perceive is that that went too quickly, is that all of those people below the line, older people, are dependent or frail, um, and somehow the people above the line are not. But in fact, in reality, we see that a significant number of older people in Japan are in fact not dependent. We see, for example, cash transfers 
uh, continuing up until people are 80, going from older people to younger people, and that there are a number of people also above that line who in fact are um, dependent. So the report fundamentally says that this line is artificial, we should get rid of it, we should be looking at societies as a whole, and we should be looking at functional ability as a continuum. There's also the feeling that, that, uh, that generally, because we perceive older people as dependent, the natural strategy from, from a policy perspective is cost containment. But if we just look at some US data from 1940 to 1990 on healthcare expenditure in the US, we can see that in fact, only 2% of the increase in healthcare costs are actually related to ageing. And much more significant drivers of increasing costs are in things like technological changes, which account for about 51%. So the report makes the case that, in fact, what we often see as costs related to ageing, whether it be healthcare, long-term care, lifelong learning, in fact, should not be perceived that way and are, in fact, investments with very clear benefits and returns for individuals and for societies as a whole. So the report defines healthy ageing as the process of developing and maintaining the functional ability that enables wellbeing in older age. Healthy ageing um, is what we say, sorry, going too fast, um, is extremely is relevant to everybody, all of us in this room, and all people can uh, potentially experience healthy ageing. And to enable healthy ageing, the report outlines a new public health framework. Um, and that, and this is just, for example, we're looking at trajectories from basically middle age um, across of intrinsic capacity and functional ability. And the report looks at what can be done across three phases uh, where you've got high and stable capacity, declining capacity, and significant loss of capacity, and what can be done at each of those different phases, um, for example, in terms of health services, long-term care, and environments, to improve intrinsic capacity. So being able to push that red bar up through, for example, prevention of chronic diseases or management of chronic diseases, um, supporting capacity enhancing behaviours, but also looks at what can be done at the level of uh, improving functional ability in long-term care and environments that can actually ensure that those trajectories are actually improved uh, over time. And within this framework, the report outlines a number of priorities for action, four. So one is aligning health systems to the older populations they now serve developing long-term care systems, ensuring that we create age-friendly environments, and improving measurement, monitoring, and understanding. So just to take these recommendations in a little bit more detail, um, to be able to create age-friendly environments, uh, it's important to involve, obviously, a number of sectors, whether that be housing or transportation, pension, social protection, um, information and communication, and a broad variety of actors, government, media, researchers, um, civil society, and service providers. Addressing ageism, we feel, needs to be at the core of any public health response. And although we know that this is challenging, we've seen that there's very good evidence that uh, other forms of discrimination, like sexism and racism, in fact, can be changed. Um, Autonomy, which Chris is going to pick up a lot more, has been shown to be, have a very powerful influence on older people's dignity, their integrity, their freedom and independence, um, and has been repeatedly identified for older people as a core component of their well-being. So older people have the right to make choices about where they live, who they live with, uh, what they wear, whether they undertake uh, medical treatment. Um, and this is an important area uh, for focus. And finally, in the area of age-friendly environments, if we're going to achieve the goals of healthy ageing, then all government sectors obviously need to work together, and things like national, regional, state action plans um, can help guide uh, intersectoral response. 
The second recommendation was aligning health systems. Um, and what the report talks about is that most of the health systems around the world are in fact quite ill-prepared to address the needs of older people who often have multiple chronic conditions as well as geriatric syndrome. And so systems need to be capable of providing older person-centred and integrated care and really focus on maintaining the red box, the intrinsic capacity of older people. And to do that, we need to first place older people at the centre of our healthcare services, which means focusing on their unique needs and their preferences, and including them as active participants in care planning and in managing uh, their health states. And this is going to need much better coordination with long-term care, um, better case management, better support for self-management and for ageing in place. And all of these also need to be part of, of the way that healthcare is provided. The second uh, core action uh, under this area is suggested focus around um, improving older people's physical and mental capacities and maximising their ability to do the things that are important to them um, and doing this instead of prioritising purely disease management. Um, and it's not to say that we're, the report rejects the idea of, of specific disease management but that by approaching older individuals through the lens of intrinsic capacity and the environments in which they live can ensure that services are orientated towards the outcomes that are much more relevant to the older people themselves. Um, and obviously if we're going to do this, a big focus is making sure that the health workforce is adequately prepared and that means they need basic knowledge and skills in geriatrics and they need to know how to work in an integrated and a coordinated system. And the research uh, within the report shows that these changes are both affordable um, and sustainable and that in fact integrated and person-centred care has been shown to have better outcomes for older people at no greater cost than, than, other, than more traditional services. The second last recommendation is around developing long-term care systems and the report says very clearly that no country in the 21st century can really afford not to have a long-term care system. Um, and the challenge for many countries is that these are going to be, need to be built from scratch. Um, so uh, regardless of the setting, comprehensive systems of long-term care are really essential to meet the needs of older people reduce uh, the dependence on acute healthcare services uh, which tend to compensate for the lack of long-term care, help families avoid catastrophic expenditure and free women up to play much broader roles uh, in society. So the report suggests that only governments can really provide the stewardship role that's needed uh, for long-term care systems. Obviously that's not that states need to do everything. Um, but each country will need to determine its system based on its unique context. As with health systems, it's going to be really crucial to train an adequate workforce in terms of long-term care, ensuring that this is sustainable um, and can provide paid caregivers with the status and the recognition that they deserve, uh, which is uh, currently not the case. Improving the quality of care will mean moving away from the notion of long-term care as a very minimal basic safety net um, and really trying to provide the services that can enable older people um, to live lives with dignity and to maximise their, their functional ability. The last recommendation of the report is really around improving measurement, monitoring and understanding and we need to better understand first really how to measure healthy ageing and what are its determinants and then how to address these. So if we're going to make significant progress on healthy ageing, it's going to require a much better understanding of age-related issues and trends and there are a number of really basic questions that still remain to be answered. So including older people in vital statistics and in general population surveys is clearly a good way to start making sure that this data is analysed by sex and age is also important. Um, but also getting a consensus around the sort of metrics and the methods that are needed um, and uh, carrying out both specific population-based research about older people as well as in 
incorporating older people within general population-based research and surveillance. And finally, uh, fostering healthy aging is going to require a much better understanding of those trajectories that we saw within the public health framework in terms of both capacity and ability um, in if we're really going to uh, understand much better around what works. So in summary, the report makes, I think, a very strong case that if we're going to invest in healthy aging, um, it means creating a future that can give older people the freedom to really live lives that previous generations have never imagined as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alana, for a very nice overview of what I think is a very rich report. Um, really, it's got a lot of um, very succinct points around aging and. I was particularly reassured uh, being a person who uh, crossed the uh, threshold last month of, <laughs> towards the older people group to hear that it's actually a continuous process and not a dichotomous variable. I feel a lot better already. So um, without further ado, and, and we'll come back to, of course, many of the issues that you raised, I would like to now introduce our second speaker, which is Professor Chris Hastmans, who is a professor of medical eth ethics at the uh, KU, which I probably stands for Katholieke Universiteit Leuven, uh, in Belgium, and he's the director of the Center of Biomedical Ethics and Law. He's also a member of the advisory panel of experts uh, of Alzheimer Europe and currently coordinating the research lines clinical ethics and care for older people and end of life care and fundamental research into care ethics. He has multiple empirical and philosophical research projects and publications to his credit and is a member of the editorial board of two journals in this area. So I'd like to invite uh, uh, Professor Hasmans to present today the philosophical ethical background that contributes to the development of a framework for providing health care for all the people. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon. First of all, I would like to thank WHO for the invitation to give a lecture in this prestigious uh, seminar series. And today I would like to present for you an ethical framework for dignity enhancing care for healthy aging. As Alana has uh, explained in the previous lecture, we are confronted with important demographic evolutions and these dem demographic evolutions confront us also with new responsibilities. For instance, what are our opinions as individual citizens, but also as society, on vulnerability? What are our opinions about autonomy? Are we following an individual concept of autonomy? Are we considering the human person as an isolated individual that should uh, develop, develop himself? Or are we more linked to a relational approach to uh, autonomy? That means that people develop themselves because they are embedded in relational contexts. What are our opinions about care and care dependency? And what are our opinions as a society and as, as individual citizen about dignity? Another important responsibility is the question, should we prepare our future? Our future as an individual citizen but also our future as a society. And what does that mean? For instance, do we have the moral duty to promote healthy aging on an individual level, for instance, by following healthy lifestyles as an individual, or on a societal level, for instance, by promoting intergenerational solidarity? The ethical framework that I would like to present today is based on three pillars. The first pillar is the lived experience pillar. The second one is the dialogical interpretative pillar. And the third one is the normative pillar. What does that mean? The first one, the first pillar, the lived experiences. 
Well, I think that care for healthy aging and ethics has in common that it has to do with what happens with human beings. And therefore, we should first look to the lived experiences of the human beings, the persons who are involved in, for instance, healthy aging practices. We should not start our ethical approach with abstract principles. That is a more deductive approach. No, we should start from how healthy aging practices are experienced by the people involved in these practices. That is a more inductive approach. approach. And in that respect, I think that the, re the results of qualitative empirical research is very important because qualitative empirical research, research enables us to understand how people experience ethically sensitive care practices, for instance, healthy aging care practices. It has also an emancipatory power because it can make silent voices heard, for instance, the voices of the older people themselves, not only the, the voices of the doctors or the professionals, but also the, the, the voices of the older people and the relatives. And I think when we look to the research on lived experiences in healthcare and uh, healthcare for older people, then I think that vulnerability is a key concept. A second pillar is the dialogical interpretative pillar. That means that care practices for healthy aging develop themselves throughout time. It has to do with a care process. It cannot be reduced to a single decision that is taken in a single moment. No, healthy aging is a process of decisions that are taken over time on a daily basis. And we should take into account that full process and the ethical quality of that full process. Healthy aging care practices are based on continuous dialogue between all people involved. But not only dialogue, also interpretation is important in that care process, because when we are dialoguing with each other, when we are going into dialogue with each other, we will experience that viewpoints that are expressed by people who are involved in care practices are never completely clear. For instance, why is it that many people have intuitive negative attitudes towards the use of robots in elderly care? That is not completely clear why it is. So we should interpret, we should understand each other by going into dialogue. Here, care is to be considered as a key concept, and that I will explain that later. And thirdly, the third pillar is the normative standard, because we are talking here about ethics. And ethics is not only about the description of lived experiences, but ethics is also about normative aspects. Normative aspects is, for instance, why should we care for healthy aging? Or what counts as good healthy aging? Or how can we use robots in elderly care in an ethically responsible way? That are ethical questions. And in that respect, I think dignity is an important concept that we could use. And I will explain that also later on. So till now I have identified three concepts that, according to me, very important. The concept of vulnerability as the basic lived experiences of people involved in care practices. The concept of care and the concept of dignity. And based on these three concepts, I can explain the ethical essence of care practices for healthy aging as follows. Healthy aging could be considered as providing care in response to the vulnerability of an older person in order to maintain, to protect, and to promote his or her dignity as much as possible. You could say this is an ethical definition of healthy aging care practices. Or to put it in a more schematic way, you see it here that vulnerability is a starting point Care, care practices can be considered as responding to that vulnerability, 
But not all care practices are good care practices. Only care practices that meet the, the, uh, the uh, normative standard of dignity can be considered as good care practices. Let us start now again, but with the three concepts that I identified. The first one, the vulnerability concept. Human life, every human life, is characterized by ordinary human vulnerability. That means that we are all vulnerable. Vulnerability is not a negative characteristic of human beings. It is a human characteristic. It is not possible to think about human beings without being vulnerable. All human beings are limited in their capacities. So that is the kind of vulnerability that we experience every moment of our life. So it is not negative. But growing old produces more than ordinary vulnerability, or produces in some cases total vulnerability. That means that the vulnerability of these older persons is situa situated in a very dominant way in all dimensions of their being. For instance, if you uh, are growing old, you have more risk, a higher risk for injuries, for illnesses. On the psychological level, you have a higher risk for depression. On the relational level, you have a higher risk for feelings of loneliness. On a social level, you have a higher risk for poverty or for discrimination or to be confronted with ageism. And on a moral level, you have a higher risk to become incompetent and not be able to organize your life according to your own moral values. And also spiritual vulnerability is there. This more than, vulnerable, more than ordinary vulnerability makes that the dignity of older persons can be threatened. When we look to the literature about the current lived experiences of older persons, and especially here in the Western societies, we see that that vulnerability is present there. For instance, older people fear, have fear of having to be dependent for, of others. And individual autonomy is in the Western societies considered as a social goal. So they have fear that they will lose their individual autonomous capacities. They have fear of losing one's dignity. And dignity is here associated with individual autonomy again. So if, we, if one loses one's intellectual capacities, then lose uh, one's dignity. And thirdly, there is also fear of being a burden. Being a burden on the financial and an emotional level, being a burden of society, but also being a burden of your own relatives and family members. And that means, for instance, that there are older people who also experience something like a duty to die. They have the impression that it would be better to die than to live further with chronic diseases or in a care-dependent state or whatever. That are all examples of being vulnerable, of the experiences of vulnerability of uh, older persons. So the care for healthy aging should be anchored in these kinds of experiences of vulnerability, because the vulnerability is the legitimation of care. The motivation to care originates with the patient's vulnerable position. Let us look now to the second concept, the care concept. Well, care for healthy aging can be considered as a uh, dialogical interpretative phenomenon because care and also healthy aging care practices always takes place and should take place in a relational context. So in that respect, I would more support the idea of relational autonomy individual older persons that are embedded in relational context of their own relatives, of their um, local community, etc. 
care originates in the concern about the vulnerable state in which a fellow human being finds himself. And in order to identify the vulnerability of an older person, we should cultivate the attitude of attentiveness. Attentive, attentiveness means that you are focused not on your own situation, but on the situation of the fellow human being, and that you try to know the vulnerable dimension of the fellow human being, the older person. That you ask what is really going on with this person and how can I care for that person. The essence of care for healthy aging is searching for the most adequate and appropriate answer to the vulnerability and how can we find the appropriate answer to the vulnerability of the older person? Well, through going into dialogue and trying to understand each other. And therefore, we should cultivate the attitudes of responsibility and competency. We should take up our responsibility as individual citizen, but also as a society to care for older persons. And if we care, if we provide care, we should do it in a competent way. Competency is a moral value, is a moral attitude that should be cultivated. For instance, we can go and we can be involved in decision-making processes concerning care initiatives to promote healthy aging. For instance, to go into communication with the physician, with the family of the older person, with the older person himself or herself, the nurses. We can go into dialogue, for instance, how we can use robots in order to promote healthy aging in a certain, uh, in a certain way, or how we can realize safe living environments, etc. All these things that are, can be realized, but only when we go into dialogue with each other. And thirdly, we come to the dignity concept. Care for healthy aging is to be considered as dignity enhancing care. Because in the beginning of my lecture, I said that the dignity of older person can be threatened due to the vulnerability they are confronted with. So the main issue is to promote the dignity. Vulnerability that affects an older person constitutes a, really a threat to the dignity itself. So the goal of care for healthy aging is the promotion of the dignity of the older person by providing good care in all dimensions of being human. That means not only in the physical dimension, but also in the psychological dimension, the relational dimension, the social dimension, the moral and the spiritual dimension. That are all the dimensions that, that should be covered by healthy aging care practices. So care for healthy aging is most meaningful when the older person is respected as a human person in all the above mentioned dimensions and not only, for instance, in the bodily dimension. Dignity is, of course, a very complicated concept. It is a multi-dimensional concept. That means that it has, in the first place, a stable dimension. There is something like a fundamental, intrinsic dignity that is linked to being a human being. All human beings have an intrinsic dignity, and that means that also the vulnerable older person, whatever in what, in what state, he finds himself, he has an intrinsic human dignity. That is the dignity that is here in the core of this picture, namely the human person has an intrinsic, stable, uh, fundamental dignity that can never be lost. But around that core of the fundamental intrinsic dignity, there are more dy dynamic dimensions of dignity that can be created, that can be supported, that can be promoted. And dignity can be created and can be promoted in all dimensions of being human beings. For instance, in the physical dimension, in the relational dimension, the social dimension, the psychological dimension, the moral dimension, and the spiritual dimension. And again, 
good, healthy aging care practices cover all these dimensions and try to promote dignity in all these dimensions. So that means that dignity implies an ongoing process of realizing and expressing dignity as much as possible. And here you see some examples of our how dignity can be realized, for instance, on the physical, bodily uh, level, by preventing diseases, by preventing disabilities, that is realizing dignity on a bodily level, or on a psychological level, by promoting opportunities for self-fulfillment for the older person, or on the relational level, by supporting the integration of the older person in the family, in the co local community, and not letting him alone as an individual. On the social dimension, you can promote the dignity by promoting intergenerational solidarity, by a good social security system, for instance. On the moral dimension, you can promote the dignity of the older person, for instance, by introducing concepts like advanced care planning that tries to identify the basic values of the human person so that they can be um, respected when the person is not able anymore to make decisions for himself because he is becoming incompetent. Let us try to uh, make an illustration now how dignity can be promoted in healthy aging practices. And I use here a very specific example, namely the use of robots in elderly care. When I speak about the use of robots in elderly care, I make a distinction between, between three kinds of robots. You have care robots that are more and more introduced in Western countries that uh, assist uh, nurses and doctors in feeding uh, older persons, in washing older persons, at, in, in providing care. On the other hand, you have monitoring robots. Monitoring robots try to monitor the room, the space where the old person lives in order to provide some communication tools or to see if if there is uh, a fall that it can be indica indicated as a dangerous situation. So it is monitor monitoring the older person and his uh, environment. And then you have the socially assistive robots that are the accompanying robots that communicate with the older person and try to exchange some feelings, etc. So how can robots or can robots improve the dignity of the human person? On the physical level, we see that care robots are very helpful to promote the bodily dignity of a human person by helping to wash the person, by helping to feeding, to feed the person, or reminding the older person when he should take medication. So it is a tool that can be used to bring care where maybe there is a shortage of nurses and nurses are not able to do all these tasks. So that is promoting bodily dignity. But on the other hand, we should be very cautious with robots because a, uh, a robot can also harm an older person when the older person gives a wrong order to the robot, for instance. And that is, of, of course, something that should be prevented. On the psychological level, we see that social contact has a positive effect on psychological well-being of older persons. That is, that is very clear. The question is, will robots decrease or increase social contact? Socially assistive robots increase the feeling of well-being. That is evidence-based. That is what we see in, in studies that uh, accompanying socially assistive robots can increase the feeling of well-being by sharing emotions with the older persons, by communicating with the older person, etc. So it decreases feelings of 
loneliness. And in that way, it is a tool to, Im to improve the dignity of the person, the older person, on a psych psychological uh, level. In a relational level, we see that with robots, that there is a danger that virtual visits that the older person has through robots, that these virtual visits replaces the real visits of the relatives, for instance. And we should be very aware that a virtual visit with a family member is different from a real visit of a family member. To be in one room with a person is different as having a Skype talk, for instance, or a telephone call. So we should be aware of that. So robots can provide communication tools that enable older people to have virtual contact that might be more frequent than real contact. But on the other hand, we should be aware that virtual visits should not replace real human visits. On the social level, we have the following questions. Does the use of robots increase the access to care services? Is, if that is the case, or if that will be the case, then it promotes the solidarity of human beings, and it promotes the social dignity. Another question is, does the use of robots promote a just distribution of scarce resources? For instance, the shortage of nurses. Are robots um, a tool to solve this problem so that care can be uh, given in situations where normally care cannot be given, for instance? And what does that mean for low-income countries, for instance? On a moral level, we have also important questions. For instance, when we are monitoring older persons, what about their privacy? Is their privacy respected? What with monitoring during bathing, during toilet visits, etc.? Who has access to the stored information of monitoring robots? Who gives the informed consent? Can we monitor a person that, can let, that can, cannot give his consent for monitoring, for instance, an incompetent demented patient. Is that possible? What about the reduction of all the persons to an object that is monitored? We should be very cautious in the introduction of uh, robots that the human person is not uh, considered as just an, an object that is cared for, but that the human person remains a human person. So, in my conclusion, I have two remarks. The first one is that there is always a danger of reductionism, also in the care for healthy aging. There is always a danger that we are mostly focused on bodily care. For instance, when I look to the literature on um, healthy aging, there is a lot of emphasis on, for instance, preventing falls, etc., and other bodily injuries. And of course, that is very important. But healthy aging or care for healthy, healthy aging should not only cover the bodily aspect of the human person, but all dimensions of the human person. And a second remark is that dignity enhancing care for healthy aging is a context sensitive phenomenon. That means that in realizing dignity enhancing care for healthy aging, we are dependent on contextual influences. For instance, we are, uh, we are dependent from our culture. What is our view on aging? When we are talking about healthy aging, doesn't that imply that aging has a negative meaning for us? Or can it also have a positive meaning? Or we are dependent on the scientific state of the art. For instance, we are dependent on how robots are developed in the future, huh? how other assistive technologies are developed in the future. And of course, we are also uh, dependent from the financial and human resources. So I come to my general recommendations. The first is that care for healthy aging requires, according to me, 
a specific ethical framework and individual, an individual autonomy-based approach doesn't fit healthy aging care practices, I think. Because in that approach, the older person is too much considered as an isolated individual that should uh, develop himself. That it is too narrow. I think we should base our ethical framework on other or broader ethical concepts. For instance, vulnerability, not as a negative characteristic of human life, but as a basic human characteristic of all human beings. On the concept of care, care not as something that is always negative, but care that is also a positive element in human life. We are mostly thinking about care in the sense of care dependency, negative uh, things, and dignity. So I think that we should, when we are talking about healthy aging care practices, first of all, we should take into account the lived experiences of older people and the people who care for, the, for older people and not starting an ethical framework with abstract principles, but based first, how is it experienced by the people involved? Another recommendation is to promote a relational embeddedness and the interdependency of older people. So again, the concept of relational autonomy and not individual autonomy. And last but not least, I think that healthy aging is a shared responsibility, not only of individual citizens, but of course also of our society as a whole. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gassman. Uh, I'm Dr. Abba Saxen. I'm taking over from T. Burma, who had to leave for another meeting at WHO. Uh, I'm the coordinator for Global Health Ethics. So, Dr. Gassman, thank you very much for your talk and explaining to us your concepts of how uh, we can provide help and support to the aging people and support them in having healthy aging lives. Um, the seminar is now open for discussion, for questions, for comments. And we, since this is a webinar, we also have some people who have logged on through the web. And uh, the way we are going to approach it is we will have questions from the floor and the first go. And then if we have any questions from the web, then we, we will then put up those questions. So I open the floor for question and answer comments. Uh, as you ask your questions, please say who you are. Use the mic. Please say who you are and which part of WHO, which, what, what is your interest in this area and what area of work you work in. So the, the floor is open for questions and comments. Ritu. Thank you, uh, Dr. Saxena. Uh, my name is Ritu Sadana, and I'm uh, in Aging and Life Course Department, along with Alana and some other colleagues who are here. Uh, thank you for the presentations. Um, I'm more familiar with the first presentation, and I really appreciated the second presentation. And I'd, I'd like to just, uh, in a way, give a little bit of discussion uh, by adding one other potential point of view, but I think it picks up very much on the last recommendation that was presented in, in, in your presentation. And, um, I, and I'm really citing uh, the issue of how to, how to, uh, how to look at um, intergenerational equity and the problem of justice uh, between age groups and age cohorts. And of course, Norm Daniels has been writing extensively on this issue now for a couple of decades. And um, I think that we can agree that the moral claims are pretty fundamental, um, but we do need to be able to shift from discussion to policies and actions. And rightly so, an ethical framework is needed to do so. In the area of universal health coverage, 
WHO about two years ago, uh, a process I and several others were involved in with Norm Daniels, tried to come up with an approach to expand coverage of services, what would be a fair way to do so. And at that time, three recommendations came out. One was to categorize services into priority classes and have very clear criteria. Uh, for example, uh, cost effectiveness, priority to the worst off, and financial risk protection. The other was to then expand coverage to um, everyone. And this includes, of course, older adults. Um, uh, and the third was to ensure that disadvantaged groups are not left behind. And what, what Norm Daniels, I think, would have added to this conversation more specifically about older adults is that when we evoke intergenerational equity without clarity on what are the values that this is based on, we may actually hide the real challenge. And I, I like very much that he proposes two questions. What is, what is fair distribution among birth age, codes, age groups? And separately, what is the fair distribution given that um, there are birth cohorts, specifically you know, the adjacent generations? So there's both the age groups and then there's also the age cohorts. And I think this question, um, your recommendation at the end, that we have to consider how to use society's resources in the most sort of just or fair way is important. Um, because on one hand, we have fairness between age groups, which Daniels claims is a problem of prudential allocation over the lifespan. And on the other hand, it's fairness to different birth cohorts which requires that each cohort enjoys rough equity in the benefits they receive given the contributions they make. And his, um, his sort of suggestion is that we have very fair processes and stable institutions that can enable this. And um, of course, that's the challenge because uh, many countries there is no institutions that are really currently developed um, to try to address these issues. And, um, and then there is the, as the population age distribution is now shifting, as populations are aging, of course, there, in many countries, there may be much more political power in older groups who may or may not want to allocate resources fairly across generations and across particular age groups. So I'll stop there, but I think that um, these additional questions that Norm Daniels has been grappling with are very pertinent to the types of resource allocation questions and institutional strengthening that we are hoping to be able to give some advice to member states to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ritu, for those helpful uh, comments. Uh, I don't know, Dr. Gaston, you want to respond to anything? or? Uh... I think it's not really a, a question, but a very useful uh, um, addition, a contribution to the, to the debate. And it makes clearly that what I said at the end, that uh, healthy aging is not only a duty or a moral duty of, a, of an individual citizen, but it is a responsibility and a moral responsibility of society as a whole. And that is an, an example what you give of, of this aspect, that we should organize our society in that way that justice is realized and respected. Uh, and especially also for the, um, that there is a fair distribution, uh, not only for the rich uh, people, but also for the um, people who have uh, less capacity to develop um, healthy aging, etc. So that's, yeah. Um, do you want to switch off your mic? Uh, yes, I agree. And Rito, thank you for actually contributing that extra bit on the ethical aspects. Um, we were, of course, constrained by the amount of time we have on the sort of issues that we can pick up. And as you pointed out, there are issues in more than one domain in the area of this, in the area of aging. 
And uh, it also means that WHO has a lot more work to do to develop some of these concepts and to see what, um, how far and, and, and what needs to be done in this area. Uh, it also brings to mind that uh, the needs of different countries are going to be different depending upon their demographic status. And so something that suits a country with, which has a demographics which is much more in the favor of older people will be different from countries where the young population is, is, is much, the proportion is much higher. So we'll have to see how that, uh, how, how that can be integrated into all these policies that countries are asked to make. Um, but are there any other questions from the floor? Yes, Nitita. Uh, thank you for those uh, excellent presentations. I'm the teacher, Tasupa Plesia from Service Delivery at the City Department. And uh, I work on patients and family engagement. Um, I would like to ask, I think I, I really uh, appreciate the three concepts that you mentioned, uh, you know, vulnerability, dignity, and care. Uh, and, but uh, I would like to ask, can you give some examples of how these, you know, OH population or the community uh, are engaged so that you understand their needs, you know, their preference, values, culture, if the care is responsive, or how dignity can be enhanced. Can you give some example on that? Thank you. Yes, well, um, what I uh, try to, to illustrate in my uh, presentation is that when we are talking from an ethical perspective on things like healthy aging practices, that we should not talk just about ethical principles because ethical principles in a certain way are abstract. And mostly ethicists are using these ethical principles to apply to concrete situations. So my approach is just the other way around. Start with concrete situations or how um, practices, care practices are experienced and try to give care as an answer to that lived experiences. And uh, concrete examples are the examples that I have uh, given that are the things that are done uh, in, in many countries. For instance, uh, promoting the dignity of the person is not a um, spiritual thing or whatever, but can be very concrete by uh, preventing falls, for instance. And for instance, by introducing um, a care robot that helps nurses to wash a patient or to feed the patient in order to find a solution for the shortage of nurses that is uh, present in, in, in some uh, countries. So it is just a tool to find a solution for current problems Western countries, for instance, are struggling with. On another uh, psychological way, we know that older people are uh, many times confronted with feelings of loneliness. So what can we do to promote uh, feelings of connectedness? Uh, and he also here, robots is, can be considered as a tool to promote healthy aging in a psychological way. That means that um, community dwelling older persons have a possibility to communicate with their caregivers, with their relatives, without um, are also in situations where the relatives are the caregivers, the nurses, for instance, are not able to go to the house of the older person. So communicating by a robot, a monitoring robot, for instance, is a concrete tool to create connectiveness and to prevent loneliness. But of course, when we introduce these kinds of techn technological uh, interventions, we should always be cautious, because sometimes we can promote dignity by these interventions, but there are also negative aspects. And we should also be cautious in order to prevent the negative aspects. For instance, when we come in situations where relatives are not going anymore to, the, to their parents because they say, oh yes, but we can have contact by, uh, by a robot or, or by a computer. Well, 
that is not a good evolution because then the virtual contact or the virtual visits are replacing the real visits. And we know that real human visits are, of course, very, very important. So that are very, very concrete uh, examples how healthy aging can be improved. Um, I, I imagine, uh, Dr. Gassman, that you're not suggesting that robots is our first line of approach, uh, that it is always a human interface and that we as a society have a have a role to play in promoting the uh, human interface and, and, and guiding society towards finding ways of communicating with the elderly, lonely people yeah. rather than the robots being the first yes. line of yeah. defense, if you say. Yeah. Um, Elena wanted to say something, and I think, Nitita, do you want to say something, or did I say what you wanted to say? Apologize, I did not make it very clear. I, my question was, how do you involve the person, the elderly person, him or herself, to take part in the care, in the intervention to, you know, understand or reduce vulnerability, or intervention to enhance dignity, as the person and the society itself. But, but I'm not talking about a robot. Thank you. Well, in a, um, that is uh, what I try to illustrate by saying that going into dialogue with all people involved is the way how we can find appropriate care answers to the need of the older person. So that means that when we try to develop interventions for healthy aging, that in the first place we should listen to the older person himself. And the older person should always give his informed consent when we try to, in, uh, to apply a certain intervention. So dialogue with the competent older person is a starting point of all interventions. Maybe just to add to that, I think, yes, starting with the needs and preferences of older people, you know, what do you want to eat? What is your preference in terms of what you'd like to wear? You know, very basic questions in terms of honing in on the needs and preferences of individuals. Um, and Chris talked about competent older people. So there is also a situation where older people may not have decisional autonomy. So what can you do in those uh, situations? Um, and so one way of addressing that is in the area of supportive decision making. So having people who are not necessarily the health practitioners, but people who know that individual very well and who can, if they're one, two or three people, be able to take decisions in collaboration with the older person to the degree that they can, but are very much embedded in the desires and, and wishes of the older person. So ensuring that those decisions are representative of what they think as closely as they possibly can that the older person would actually, uh, the decision the older person would take themselves. So there are a number of strategies uh, around being able to support older people if they, if they lose uh, capacity, um, to be able to also continue to live lives that are in the essence of what they would have potentially chosen if, if they had those competencies. Thank you, Elana. And we have a question from South Africa, uh, from Claude Kirimuzia. I hope I got the pronunciation correct, from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And I think this question is for you, Alana. Uh, what could be the factors that are influencing the shift to higher average age? In countries with high levels of unemployment, is this not a serious threat to healthy aging? Hi, Claude. Uh, thanks a lot for your question. Um, I mean, the factors that are influencing the shift in populations uh, to a larger percentage of older people is obviously that uh, fewer people are dying at younger ages um, from communicable diseases, which has previously been the case, or, di or dying in, uh, in childbirth. Um, other factors, obviously, in terms of improved uh, health care and social policies are also having a significant impact on uh, the numbers of people who are living uh, to older age. In countries with high levels of unemployment, is this not a serious threat to healthy aging? Um, 
clearly having decent work, having social protection and financial coverage are, and, and you'll see in the report, we, t we talk about these as domains of functional ability, and one of them is basic needs, which covers adequate housing, financial protection, and, and personal security, um, you know, amongst health and other things. So yes, uh, the lack of financial security is indeed a serious threat to, to healthy ageing. Um, and the report focuses on what can be done um, around, obviously, in older age, what's done in, in, in younger age in terms of improving financial security obviously has an impact on older age, but looking at the necessity to have uh, social protection and social safety net, um, but also uh, decent working conditions that uh, support uh, you know, the maintenance or building of capacity across life um, are really important. So I think that, yes, ensuring that um, people of working age can, can get access to uh, decent employment is an important strategy overall to improve healthy ageing of populations. Thank you, Elana. Uh, we have a couple of more questions from the floor. I have Michele who wants to ask a question. Michele is from Italy. Uh, can you just say who you are? And then... Yes. <clears throat> I'm a consultant to WHO, Global Aesthetics, and my background is in political philosophy. So I have a question for Professor Officer. Um, so you mentioned uh, at the beginning of your presentation that um, there should be one of the recommendations is that interventions to promote healthy aging should not uh, um, contribute to the gap between socioeconomic, uh, the, between the expectations of people from different socioeconomic status. So my question is, um, because it's a sad fact of public health that sometimes the interventions that are enacted to improve public I mean, aggregate uh, as outcomes actually increase the gap between the socioeconomic groups. So, <clears throat> the question is, in the case in which we are not, I mean, in which this happens and we are not able not to make it happen, what value should take priority? Uh, improving outcomes or not increasing uh, inequality? And also, what is the implication for the investment? Because it seems then that the investment in healthy aging is not in everyone's interest equally. It's more in the interest of uh, the high uh, socioeconomic status groups. And then I have a question for um, Professor uh, Gastman. Um, I was a bit surprised coming from a lot of work on. Uh, molecular biomedicine um, that you didn't make room for the idea of uh, this, you know, there's a, a lot of hype about this personalized, predictive, preventive uh, uh, medicine. And I was wondering uh, whether your uh, ethical framework can be expanded, utilized to deal with that aspect of healthy aging prevention. There. These are great questions. You know, I'm very fortunate to be in the room with people who have worked very significantly on the report, yeah? So I would say, um, and I'm going to defer to some of them, I just wanted maybe, while I've got the opportunity, um, uh, Somnat Chatterjee, who's to your right, uh, Ritu Sadana, and is Lene, are you still there or did you leave? Ah, she just left, all right. Um, all right, so um, who are also well placed to, to contribute. I would say that uh, healthy ageing is actually in the interest of all of us, um, not only uh, those in higher socioeconomic groups. What we've seen in some of the research is clearly um, that uh, when you look at uh, the, those trajectories of healthy ageing, it is obviously the, the, the better off that do much better on those trajectories. Um, and the, the, the least well off have the least resources and generally experience the poor, poorer health. Um, so obviously the strategy in terms of healthy ageing is uh, not reinforcing those inequities. And I'd actually like to go to Ritu, who's done a lot more work in this area, and answering the question is, uh, what is the greatest value in terms of improving outcomes or not increasing inequality? Did you want to answer that one, Ritu? I thought you'd like that one. Answer it is a big, that's a very big expectation. But maybe just some, 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 some issues. 
I mean, it's an excellent question, and it's how to get the balance right. I mean, clearly, on one hand, we are concerned about outcomes. We are concerned about the level, you know, and you could break it down into a couple of specific outcomes. Uh, we do care about length of life, but we care that length of life is with good quality, with meaningfulness, and sometimes how you determine that is really very personal. But from, let's say, WHO global health statistics, we basically have average life expectancy and we have this interesting uh, thing called healthy life expectancy, which gives kind of a very rough indication, but it's the average level and we can break it down by male and female for our 194 countries. Then we have a lot of other specific outcomes that we do care about, and some not can talk about those in great detail, but for, our, but for very few countries in terms of if you think about outside of high-income countries. But I think what you're really getting at is um, we don't want to contribute to accumulating more deficits across the life course uh, using the vulnerability, uh, the middle term that was used. We want to actually, rather than increase vulnerabilities, we want to increase strengths and assets. And there are lots of promoting things that we can do that put people on better trajectories early on. So. For example, this is not specific to healthy aging, but we know early child development programs are excellent to level the playing field for people from all different types of socioeconomic backgrounds and getting them on a better trajectory, not only for health outcomes, but for a host of other social and economic outcomes that we value. And our challenge in healthy aging is that we know such things exist. We have a little bit of good evidence from the few longitudinal cohort studies that look at these issues, but we don't have enough generalizable evidence to say early in life, these are the three key things that should be done as adolescents, as young adults, and as older adults. We're going to hopefully get there, and that's part of the call for the, from the report, but it's precisely that if we only look at the level, the, 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 the goodness of the outcome, we could, in fact, promote diffusion of assistive technologies, diffusion of other services and pharmaceuticals that really just increase the gap rather than actually lift everyone up and higher. Because we're not interested in just looking at the 10% poorest. Because that's, there's a huge middle group, depending on the pattern of inequities or inequalities that could be considered inequities in countries, where maybe 60% of the population will be then ignored that could be. So it's a very big challenge. I don't think I can answer the question, but we hope over the next five years working with research institutions to kind of push this question on what are the key things that are critical over the life course in very diverse settings, which can do precisely what I think your question was raising. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, in my lecture, I was um, proposing a certain ethical framework, and an ethical framework is always very general. It, I, I was uh, referring to the basic values that I would like to, uh, to emphasize. And in a certain sense, I was trying to give an alternative of another ethical framework that is used most of the time in public health ethics, and that is the framework of the principalism, uh, the, the principles of biomedical ethics with the respect for autonomy, individual autonomy as the highest principle. So that is what I would like to do, to see an, another framework that other ethical concepts are relevant in order to discuss these uh, problems. I was not focusing on, trans, uh, uh, on a concrete translation on, uh, into operational interventions, but of course the interventions are the, the domains that you are suggesting like preventive medicine, personalized medicine, that are all tools that should be used in order to promote healthy aging. So, um, but that was not my, my concrete uh, focus of my, of my lecture. But these uh, interventions that you suggest are, are not excluded in my ethical framework. 
thank you. I think we have a few minutes left, and we have one last question from the floor. Vanya, you want to ask your question? Hello, thank you very much for both of your presentations. I have a question for Professor Gassman. Uh, you want to introduce yourself? Yes, yeah, sorry. I'm Vanya de la Fuente, and I work in the Global Health Ethics Unit. And the question relates to the use of relational autonomy and whether you could expand on how that applies to older people and how that can be used as a concept for the development of policy in, in, your, in your framework. And we have about two minutes for you to do that. <laughs> Well, it has to do with the anthropology that you that you use when we are using concepts like autonomy uh, and dignity, ethical concepts. We should always link these uh, concepts to um, uh, the anthropology that is behind these concepts. For instance, autonomy is very clear. You can link it with an anthropology where the human person is considered as an isolated individual that has a duty to develop himself. Yeah. And yeah, then respect for individual autonomy is the highest principle. But you can also link another anthrop anthropology to autonomy, where you consider the human person, of course, as an individual, but also as a fellow human being. And that being dependent on other persons or being related to other persons is not con uh, contrary to individual autonomy because we can develop ourselves as a human being by building up relations with other people. And that is a more relational concept. And for older uh, persons, our care for older persons, I think that's very relevant because the main issue in older persons is that they feel themselves alone. Feeling, feelings of loneliness are very, um, very high in older persons. So what we should do is to connect, try to connect these persons with, with other beings, with other uh, human beings. For instance, their relatives, uh, but also the local community where, uh, where they live, etc. And that is a real challenge because it's not uh, easy to, to do it. Uh, for instance, even older persons who are living in a nursing home, where a lot of people live, they can feel very alone. So what we should do is to make links between the nursing home and the local community in order to, um, to improve feelings of connectedness. Thank you. Um, I think that was an excellent example. And actually, I would, I would go so far as to say that relational autonomy is not only relevant for the older people, uh, it's actually one of the ways in which a lot of the cultures uh, experience or, or put more value on relational autonomy than on personal autonomy. So I think that also depends upon the cultural context. Uh, but with these few words, I'd like to actually thank both our speakers today, Alana Officer and Chris Gassman, for the fantastic talks that you gave and the issues that you raised in relation to um, providing care to our aging population and then the, the lot of work that needs to be done in this area. So thank you for raising those issues as well. And thank you for everyone who joined us here and everyone who joined us virtually. Thank you very much. And be on the lookout for the next Global Health Ethics Seminar coming soon. Thank you.